Good evening, everyone. Good evening. Welcome to, uh, what's this, April the 13th? Yes. Wednesday, the middle of the second week. I'm delighted to see you. I always am. Thank you very much for taking the time to come and worship God, to listen to His Word. God is taking note of your faithfulness, and I want you to know that. Amen. While God does not owe us anything, but God loves us to see how much He delights when we make time for Him. So I want you to know that God is keeping note of your faithful attendance and He will bless you in ways that you may not imagine. So thank you very much for coming. I did not see those who are here for the first time. Would you kindly raise your hand so I may see you? First time guests, all right? Thank you. Thank you. Who else? First time? Just two? I thought I heard more than two. All right. And your name is? Beverly. Beverly. And the name is? Sonia, Sonia and Beverly, may God bless you and your families. Thank you for being here with us. And those of you who have been coming night after night, thank you so much and may God bless you, bless you richly. And we pray that God will grant traveling mercies to those who are on their way, that they may arrive safely. While we were coming, uh, Brother Christian and I, uh, there was an accident. And um, one of the participants in the accident just drove off, I suppose, and left the poor lady with the front of her car heavily disfigured. And I said, Lord, please help that lady. She looks so helpless trying to get the car out of the road. Uh, the devil is always trying to put an end to your life. Yes. Because he knows that if he can get you before you give it all to Christ, then it'll be too late for him. And so whenever God brings you someplace safely, don't take it for granted, not because you drive well, you have a license. But because they are angels that protect you. Amen. There is a statement in Our High Calling, page 23, paragraph 2. A very encouraging statement. As long as there is hope, until they resist the Holy Ghost to their eternal ruin, men are guarded by heavenly intelligences. Amen. Men and women, all people. And so what the expression is saying, what the statement is saying, as long as God sees there is some hope that you will turn around, he assigns an angel to protect you. Amen. So we thank God for His love, His patience, His forbearance. Before I begin, please do three favors for me. Number one, if you have a cell phone, would you kindly turn it off? Heaven and earth will be pleased. Just turn your cell phones off. Not on vibrate, we want them off. No one is disturbed or distracted. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, I'd like you to pray for me. And I want you to say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. And I've told you before, I'm telling you again, I'm very serious about that request. And I'm grateful to those of you who have complied with my request and have been praying for me. And favor number three, we want you to think, think. Our subject for this evening, by any means necessary. By any means necessary. Let's bow our heads and pray. Loving Father in heaven, we come to you at your invitation to come to the throne of grace. We come not based on our merits because we have none. We come in the name of Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We ask today, God, forgive our sins, cleanse our hearts, we pray, and grant us the infilling of your Spirit, for he alone can guide us and lead us into truth. Speak through me very directly, Father, that my words may come directly from the throne, and as they enter the hearts of your people, they may do a work of transformation. So please, Father, bless this service to your glory, we pray, and we thank you for hearing us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. By any means necessary, go with me to Luke chapter 15. We shall begin reading at verse 1. Luke chapter 15, reading from verse 1. Luke was not one of the twelve disciples, neither was Mark. Luke was a medical doctor, also a first-rate historian, and modern historians who have studied the book of Luke and Acts, because he wrote two books, have concluded that he was one of the finest, if not the finest, of ancient historians. Because every person, every event that Luke records can be verified by secular history. So we thank God for a great historian in the person of Luke. Chapter 15, reading from verse 1. 
Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the mighty and mine in wilderness, and go after that which was lost until he find it. I like that word, until. And if you reflect on the word until, it brings tremendous hope to you. Now this is a reference to God, how God receives sinners. God in Christ, of course. What man of you, Luke 15, 4, having a hundred sheep, if he lose, how many? One. Doth not leave the mighty and nine in the wilderness and go after that which was lost until he find it. God is very determined to save every sinner. He himself declares through Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3 verse 9 that he is not willing that any should perish. But I want you to observe the class of people Christ is referring to that God goes to extremes to save. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. Now the scribes of Pharisees, they murmured saying, this man receiveth sinners. We have two classes of people in that passage. The Pharisees and the scribes, the upper class, the upper crust, as they say in Hollywood, the A-listers. The publicans and sinners, as we say, the scum of the earth. And Jesus is telling this parable to show how God receives the very lowest of earthly societies. The people we ignore, the people we hope never pass by our way. We leave other people to take care of them. Jesus is expressing the way his father receives the very lowest of society's cast-offs. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the mighty and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which was lost, until he find it. Now God has to go after us, because we don't come after him. Well, that goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. And the Lord God called unto Adam and said to him, Where art thou? God comes looking for us. Jesus told Nicodemus in the same book of Luke, chapter 19, verse 10, The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. If God does not seek you, he cannot save you. The seeking is part of the plan of salvation. The seeking is not the discreet act of justifying you, but the seeking is part of the overall arrangement to save a man and a woman, however low that person may be. And so Jesus said, the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. And it is very possible that through this series entitled The New Day, God is seeking someone to save that person. And when he found it, he laid it on his shoulder rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. This is how God reacts when he finds a sinner, and the sinner does not resist God's approach. Amen. Verse 7 of Luke 15. I say unto you that likewise there is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth, more than over ninety of nine just persons which need no repentance. Let's look at that verse a little clearer, a little more clearly. There is joy in heaven over one sinner that repenteth. If you read verse 10, it says, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Using the law of opposites, the principle of opposites, as I've mentioned to you before, think with me. If all of heaven rejoices when one sinner comes to Christ, what happens in heaven when one sinner is lost? All of heaven mourns and grieves. <clears throat> if anyone listening to me does not make it to the kingdom, all of heaven will grieve. Heaven 
grieves now because every day the probation of some is closing. Every hour, some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. Last day events, page 140, paragraph 3. Every day, the probation of some is closing. Every hour, some are passing beyond the reach of mercy. And so as I speak and you listen, there is grief in heaven. All of heaven grieves and will grieve if any one of us does not make it to heaven and it will not be God's fault but heaven will grieve the heart of God will break because God has a place in his heart for every person that's why the Bible says for God so loved the world meaning everyone that he gave his only begotten son God's desire is to save everybody <clears throat> the reality is most people will be lost not because God does not know how to save Isaiah 59 tells us, verse 2, God's, verse 1 and 2, God's hand is not heavy, that he cannot save, nor his ear that he cannot hear, his hand not short that he cannot save, and his ear heavy that he cannot hear. The problem is sin. But God did something. As a virtual, and I say virtual, almost a guarantee that no one could be lost. Notice, almost a guarantee that no one would be lost. God did something in his, let me use human language, desperate attempt to try and save everyone. Let's take a look at what it was God did. As we continue, by any means necessary. Let's go to Genesis chapter 12. We shall read from verse 1. And we've read that passage before. It is, in my view, one of the most basic passages in all the Bible. Very important, very central to understanding salvation and the promise God made to Abraham and to his seed. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1, our subject is, by any means necessary. Welcome to those of you who are on your way in. We're delighted to have you. Come right in. God bless you. We're glad you made it safely. Genesis 12, reading from verse 1, the Bible says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. Now listen to the verses 2 and 3. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Now God's made a promise to Abraham. I will make of thee a great nation. I will bless thee. I will make thy name great. Thou shalt be a blessing. In other words, I will make you a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee. And curse him that curseth thee. God has two responses, a blessing or a curse. And so if you read Galatians, don't go there. Galatians chapter 3, verse 13, it says, God hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, curses everyone that hangeth on the tree. The next verse says that the blessing of Abraham by coming to Gentiles, that we might receive this promise of the Spirit through faith. So Christ became a curse that we might receive the blessing is either curse or blessing. And God says, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And the ultimate blessing, of course, and in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that blessing is, of course, righteousness by faith, which Christ brought when he came to this earth, and which was made available, of course, by faith in his blood. That was a promise. Now, when God makes a promise, does God renege on his promises? No. Let's find out why. Numbers chapter 23, reading verse 19. By any means necessary is our subject. Does God go back on his word when he makes a promise? And you all said correctly, no. We need to find out why. Numbers 23, reading verse 19. Numbers is book number 4. You have Numbers 23, verse 19. It's 730. For those of you with us for the first time, we try to finish no later than 8.15.